Morning, everyone. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. Hi, Mary. Morning. All right, we'll just wait a few minutes. I'm going to email Lamar. Okay. Put my mask on. I'm telling you, my life would be so much different if I didn't have glasses and a mask. Totally fogs everything up. Oh, yeah, in the winter time, especially when you go out, uh, it really fogs everything up. Yeah, I can't see. Yeah. I can take my glasses off. <laughs> yeah, it does. I can imagine what it's going to be like in the snow. I know. Well, I'm used to, you know, I guess it just happens. The second I breathe, my glasses get fogged. I told you, so whoever invents something to prevent that from happening, like a good thing, is going to make a lot of money. They, you know, they have the lens that uh, doesn't fog up. You know that, right? Does it work? Uh, I have them. Uh, not not as bad, but not 100%. I think we should um, think money. about something like that. You know, my uh, somebody that I, I grew up with um, who was a bazillionaire growing up, his father invented, you know that thing that you pull to take off the milk? That little piece of plastic? Yeah. Yeah, he invented that, bazillionaire. <laughs> My morning. cats love that little piece, that little piece of plastic. <laughs> yeah. That's very dangerous for cats. Good morning, Francis. Oh no, they love it. It's the best toy. Um, Louis, you have you have all the materials that I sent, right, to put the agenda up? I do. They're in the shared folder that everyone on DLT can access. The folder's on the website. I will. Yeah, just flash up the agenda, and then we'll do the minutes really quickly. Um, just have, leave the agenda up for right now, and then. Um, yep. I'm just going to wait one more minute. We have, let me see who we have here. Uh, and Abby, if you have anything you want to share yeah. with the public uh, after your presentation, you can send it to me. I'll put it in the folder also. As well. Okay. And All like right, always, so we ask everyone please sign in. I'll put the sign in as, as well. So Francis, Lewis, Mary, Jin May. All right, so we have representation from high school from Bill. Um, okay. Louis, am I still inviting Janine Warner? Do you, or are you inviting her every? Because she has to decline so, it, or is she not? So, um, uh, if I made the Outlook invite, then she's on it. Okay. On the Outlook invite. Yeah, she is. Want me to okay. Yeah. That? Yeah, because she's got to decline every month because she's. All she, right. Um, uh, uh, um, Dr. Warner, I spoke to her. She said that she's not doing this anymore. That she was asking me who they assigned. I, I, I didn't. I, I don't know who they assigned yet. So there's a few people from high school. So Bill, who's on right now, William Doyle, he's from high school. Um, Sharif Rucker, um, he's also a representative. And then you have Elaine and uh, Lenine, the uh, uh, superintendent and deputy, who often come in to present. But for today, it's Bill. They have a, a team of people that represent high school. OK, so I think I'm going to start. Um, and then we'll just let people in as we come. Uh, UFT we're waiting on, and I just uh, heard from him that he's coming in. Um, high school president's council. I'll actually see if I can request them to join. And okay. Louis, this is Francis. Um, I can't do the sign-in sheets. I haven't been able to do it. It, it comes in blank on my computer. Uh, I don't know how to sign in. Uh, so if you just go to the website, you can click on the sign in button if the link is not working in the chat. And Lewis, can you do me a favor and um, yep. add. Hold on. It's somebody else who needs to be added to this. Um, to the invite. Yep. Uh, James Vasquez. Uh, 
James Vasquez at U of T? Yes. He's, uh, his email is in the DLT email. It's, uh, yep, I know I have him. I have him. Perfect. Okay. All right, so I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order, and we can start, Lewis, if you would flash up September minutes so we can read them and approve them, because I know we have a really, really big agenda today and a couple of presenters that I wanted to make sure that we had access to. And as you all know, um, I, I sent the, everyone on the DLT all of this information, but it is also on our website, which you have access to by clicking on the link. Um, one of the things that I'm going to ask this month as you're reading through this is that every all of our constituencies, if you could highlight our website to the to your constituencies so they have access to this information too. So. For example, um, Francis, if you can announce it at President's Council, and Joe, if you can announce it at CEC. Um, I know that uh, our principals all know about it, Mary, so thank you. But if we could just uh, highlight it and, and let people know that our monthly meetings are there and that they're recorded, um, and there's a lot of information that the community could gain access to by spending some time looking through our minutes and our agendas just to see the topics that we're covering. Lewis, um, apparently there's a problem because Lamar is saying he's in a room with two other people. I don't, I don't understand what that means. He should I don't know. He, uh, make sure that we're, if they're in a room together, they should be wearing masks. No. <laughs> oh my Boom. God. Oh, <laughs> is, did I send them the wrong link? Go check on the link that I sent. Lewis, stop laughing at yes, your own joke. Good. Did you guys get the link Lewis, from my email? Lewis, it happened to me at one point, uh, and what I was told was that I was going in not through Microsoft Teams on my um, 365 calendar. So it's necessary that you go through your 365 calendar. So, so am I sending the wrong link on my email? No, they can they can join right from the from. Did you see the email that I sent? I mean, everyone else joined, so. Yeah, but they might not have joined through my email. They might have joined. Send Lamar the link. Yeah, but I need to make sure I'm sending them the right link in my email. I'm looking for your email. Hold on. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, you should never share a Microsoft Teams link with anyone. You should only share the link to the website. Okay. So did I send the wrong uh, link? You did. I don't know what this oh. conference ID ending in 062, the conference <laughs> room that the mean that we're in, the conference ID ends in 345. Okay. All right. Am I sending it? Lewis sending it. I got it. I got it. All right, so resend it. It's the three of them. All right, so I'm not sending that link anymore. Okay. Yeah, just send to the web, the D DLT website. That's the best way to get joined. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm texting him.
Might have been last 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 year's length. I think it is. All right, the Mars in. Hi, Owen Queens High School President's Council. Hi, guys. Sorry, I apologize. That link is the wrong link that I sent. The one to just click on to Teams. So I'm going to remove it from the next email and just give the DLT website link. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Morning. Good morning, Lamar. Good morning. Okay, so right now we're just going over the minutes which I had sent to you earlier over the weekend, and, and we're going to ask for an approval. So you can continue, Lewis. What? What's funny? Just want to make a correction on the um, paragraph about the community education next meeting. It's Tuesday, November tomorrow, actually. Oh, yes, yes. Jenna, if you could just make sure that those are that they're corrected. Okay. Thank you. And I think this is it. Yep. yep. OK, so can I get a motion to approve with uh, recommended corrections? Motion to approve. OK, Joe, in a second. We have consensus um, on motions. OK, thank you. OK, so um, I wanted to start, and, and I apologize for bouncing a little bit all over the agenda because we have couple of people who um, are uh, making presentations, but they also have meetings later on today. So I know that there have been a lot of questions across the community around the special education recovery services program. So we have Abby Lewis here from Queens North Borough office, um, and she is going to talk a little bit about uh, what this looks like in District 25, and I want to give a big thank you to Abby for being such a huge support to our schools to help them set up these services. <laughs> I know it has been a huge Herculean task to, to keep all of that in order and organized, and 
support our schools and, and help them with staffing. So I want to say thank you for that. Um, Abby and, and Joe Di Benedetto is here from our uh, CEC. Uh, Joe, this is who's going to be presenting to the community tomorrow at the CEC as well. So I want to welcome you, Abby, and give you an opportunity to present on our recovery services. Hi, thank you so much. Would you like me to screen share or Lewis, did you want to? Screen share. Oh, if you if you could do it, that'd be great. Yep. Okay, can everyone still hear me? Yep, okay. we can hear you. So back on July 9th, uh, Chancellor Porter announced the academ academic recovery vision um, for all of New York City's public schools and students. And um, the framework, um, it guides school communities uh, through the new school year. Um, with a specific uh, focus on six critical areas. So one being early literacy for all uh, developing students as digital citizens, preparing for college and careers, investing in special education services, which we'll talk about today, and building a rigorous and inclusive universal curriculum. Included is a $251 million investment for special education services targeted to improve outcomes for students with IEPs. And so that $251 million um, is earmarked for in several areas. Number one, launching after school and Saturday programs for all students with IEPs to receive additional instruction and related services. And that's what we'll talk about today. Um, and it's now become known as special education um, recovery services. And so these are some other bullets um, of where that investment is going as well. If you wanted to take a look there. And so this $251 million investment known as Special Education Recovery Services is intended to support schools and the important work of collaborating with families to determine what kind of specialized instruction and or related services each student with an IEP will need to ensure a successful homecoming. Um, in addition to supporting students with IEPs through the school-wide approach to academic recovery, schools um, should reference the uh, special education guidance uh, document, which I'll share with you in a moment. And um, special education recovery services might include additional intervention for students with and without IEPs, um, both during and after the school day, depending on the needs of the student. And so what are uh, special education recovery services? They are now in-person or remote specialized instruction and or related services. Um, and what the child receives in terms of program and or services is determined by the school team on an individual basis and is informed by uh, a data collection and analysis on student progress, um, progress toward IEP goals and also um, progress in terms of achievement and uh, universal screening data in literacy and in math and then also related services. And the intention is to um, help with recovery services to help close gaps that were specifically brought on as a result of the pandemic's disruption to learning. Special education recovery services provide students with targeted services that will supplant and not supplant students IEP programs and services. And so um, Specifically, we're thinking about literacy interventions 
using research validated programs um, such as Spire, um, Rewards, Wilson, um, or uh, programs do the math, um, and then um, specific research-based strategies for related services that are targeted towards IEP goals. Um, so um, the uh, re recovery services are targeted towards individual students and their specific needs. And so each student's services might look different and students might be served in a group of one or two or in small groups um, of five or six students. And their grouping should be, and, this, and the intervention program that they are receiving should be determined based on data that we have, um, whether it's from a universal screening um, or the progress toward IEP, IEP goals that we're referencing. And special education recovery services are not part of core instruction. So in rare cases, we can, they can be provided during the school day, um, but the um, intention is really that they are provided before school, after school, or on Saturdays. Um, and they're intended to be a form of AIS. And so that would be separate from core instruction, thinking more about uh, tier two and tier three interventions when we're thinking about like an MTSS model. Uh, special education recovery services are not for general education students, so students have to have an IEP and parents, um, of course, have to consent to services. Um, and they, they are not provided at the same time for all students, so but rather in cycles. So while some students, um, students are prioritized um, based on need, um, which has been determined from our data systems from CSIS, and students are prioritized into three different groups with the first, the highest priority students being served first and may be served over three different cycles over the course of the school year, um, each student. So if a student is in priority group one, uh, they may be beginning services in sometime in November or December and um, their cycle should last 10 weeks and they should have services for a minimum of two hours per week in an instructional program and or they may also receive support in related services if the team has determined um, that there is a need there as well. And again, the services are meant to supplant and not replace um, the IEP. And we may see a recommendation on an IEP for a particular program or service. Um, and then that's not exactly what's provided during recovery services. So the goal is to identify what the student's most critical needs are through a view of data, and then to align a research validated intervention program in literacy, math, um, or those uh, research validated uh, related services for recovery. So, so Abby, just for the record, for literacy, a lot of our um, recovery programs are using LLI and uh, foundations just so okay yeah just and that makes a lot of sense because that's what schools are doing also during the school day so it's something that mm -hmm. students are familiar with and, and their programs that have been really successful mm -hmm. so So in terms of the guidance, um, the guidance document that Central has issued that schools are using to uh, reference and base their programs on, there are these three different priority groups. And so if we could just take a look at uh, priority group one, and if you could identify from this chart, what date are our, our CSIS, our SERS plans due? So every, for every student that's gonna receive a service, we come up with, we have to create a plan. It's just a notice and thesis. And so if we could just look to identify that due date for priority group one. It was last week, right? 11-1? Yeah, no November 1st. And then right. services begin, must begin by December 6th. Okay. okay. And so as you are we Are we on the right track, Abby? How's District 25? Are we ready to begin? I think so. Um, okay. But we can look at your data. But everybody's, yeah. And I speak with them almost daily. And I mean, the schools are, you know, they're, they're doing their best with getting information on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, but everybody is, yeah, up and running and organizing. 
Perfect. And so that's part of the messaging to parents. While every student might not be served during priority one, group one, um, and in the first cycle, that the goal is that they will be served throughout the school year. And so priority, um, if you just make note, so here are some minimums that schools uh, have to abide by, and those are the minimum program and then the mi minimum service. And so it's 20 hours per cycle in the instructional program. So that's thinking about the actual literacy or the math intervention. So that's a minimum 20 hours, which in a 10 week cycle, which is the minimum, it comes out to two hours per week. And then relate for each related service, it's a minimum of that 10 hours. And so priority group two. And so this is the guidance for schools as well in terms of their minimums. So the instructional program is 16 hours and then related services in, is eight. Um, all of the plans, so plans due by November 5th and then um, services to begin by December 13th for priority group two. And then priority group three is our last cycle. And these plans as well were expected to be done by November 15th with services beginning by January. And schools can schedule to begin if they have staff available and are able to schedule, can begin services prior to that point. I have a question, may I? I'm not sure, Abby. Um, um, who initiates the process? Is it initiated by the schools or what? In other words, what happens if a parent feels that their child is in need yeah, that's an excellent question. So every every child with an IEP, um, parents are entitled to um, to request recovery services. So as long as your child has an IEP, if you feel that there's a need, it would be a conversation to contact the school, and then the school will look to serve the student uh, at some point during the school year in one of the cycles. So parents can make that request or it can come from the school. Initially, schools received a report through CSIS, um, their special education, their IEP system, that um, indicated students that should be prioritized based on data that had been entered in the systems. So if data had been entered in the system that a student did not attend much school last year, either school or did not attend their related services um, often, um, or if they did not make adequate progress toward their IEP goals, these students would be flagged on a report that was generated. Um, so the Department of Ed has used the systems that exist where we can update progress for students with IEPs and has uh, flagged certain students as needing additional support, as needing recovery services because the systems, the data in the systems is telling us that there was a lack of progress or a lack of service delivery last year. And so this is an attempt to, um, you know, provide a compensatory service for that time. Um, but it can also, so even if a student isn't on that initial report from CSIS, a parent can at any point, you know, request, and then we seek to provide it. And so these are just some additional resources that I just wanted to um, share with you and you'll have this PowerPoint as well. So the first link is the special education guidance document and it will prompt you to sign in. And if you so if you don't have this login, um, if you could I guess we would just want to we'll want to make this available. Yeah, this document is not uh, public facing. And so this just mostly has that chart that we were uh, looking at. And it just defines what recovery services are and that chart for service delivery. All right, does anybody have any questions for Abby? I have one. Okay. Um, how you doing, by the way? Hi, Hi. thank you. Hi, I'm, I don't know if we met. I'm Lamar Hughes. I'm the UFC rep for District 25, the district rep. So 
Um, the work is geared towards special education teachers. Is there any space for gen ed teachers to um, participate or to support the special ed, the special ed counterparts? Yes. So that uh, guidance was just shared recently where uh, teachers that hold a general education license can work in the program as well. And then we, of course, just want to make sure that they're trained in the specific intervention programs that they'll be using um, so they're prepared. But that's, you know, the yeah. same. Which is, yeah, which is good for District 25 because we've done a lot of work, especially through our um, MBK, My Brother Keeper Fund at the district level. We have a lot of teachers who are trained in um, some of the interventions that we're using across the district, such as LLI, Great Leaps, foundations, whatever um, tool that is used or program is used. Um, we've invested a lot of time in training our teachers um, to administer those programs. All right, Abby, is that it? Yeah, I think so. These are just some other resources. There was a webinar for parents that was held early on. Um, and um, so that's linked here as well. Um, if anyone would like to check that out, um, that was specifically targeted for a parent audience. Uh, one, one other question or request. I was taking screenshots of the photos. Can you go back to the first first screen if you don't mind? Sure. So these slides have been shared now in our in the folder for this meeting. You can have access to them as well. This one? You're not sharing your screen anymore, Abby. Oh, I'm sorry. The next one. Yep, that one. Okay. <laughs> we we actually heard you take you a heard, picture. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's more, really the, funny. <laughs> you, can, you can you can have access to all the slides. I put them in the folder for the Yeah, so I you know I think the important piece is, and we've done this before, um, is that we want to really be able to target all students and, and there's programs that are running simultaneously based on school need and work of individual principals and their SLTs around what other types of programs we will run uh, for struggling learners. Um, but the academic recovery program is for students in special education who um, may not have received enough services last year. Um, or who we believe we want to make up for that time or who we want to address right away this September based on the screeners that we gave in the beginning of the year, which was the iReady and um, uh, the iReady for ELA in three to eight and iReady in math K to eight and then Acadians in, in literacy for K to two. So we really wanna start looking at those that data, comparing what students learning gaps may look like and align to their IEP and then offering targeted programs to help accelerate and those gaps to make sure that those gaps are closing um, at a faster rate than just happening as tier one, which is in the classroom, right? Abby, did I say that correctly? You did. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I know that you have another meeting. I want to say thank you. Is there anybody else that has any questions for Abby before we go? Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, Abby. You're always Thanks, welcome to Abby. stay, but if not, um, I, we will see you tomorrow. Okay. Have a okay. good one. Great. Great. Um, okay. So as I said, I'm going to be bouncing around um, just a little bit for some of the things that are, that are happening be, uh, on the agenda because we just have so many things. The first thing I want, the next thing I want to talk about is our pop-up vaccination sites, which many of you um, have heard that starting this week, every day, there will be pop-up vaccination sites um, at our schools for students um, age 5 to 12. Lewis, feel free to correct me. 11. 11. 11. 5 to 11 to get um, the vaccines. Their parents can come early in the morning. Some of the vaccination sites start at seven and then in the afternoon sessions, they end at four, but they can come in the morning, have their child get their vaccines. Um, and so Lewis, I didn't want, I didn't know if you wanted to speak a little bit about that because I know you're excited about our vaccinations. Uh, just, just 
every school is communicating to their community on the day and time that the vaccine clinics will be open there. So just make sure that families uh, uh, speak to their schools and look out for notification from their schools as far as when uh, they'll be there. And our whole district is will have clinics either today or tomorrow. If we have one school that's on the tail end of, of the beginning of next week, uh, one middle school, but most of the, all of our schools will have vaccine clinics today and tomorrow. Yep. Joe, did you have a question or was your hand up from? I, I did. I'm not sure if Francis had a question before me. I don't want to. Yeah, okay. yeah, I had a question. Um, what is, uh, is the DOE doing these vaccines? Uh, who? Because what are the legalities if someone in the, in, in the school of a child gets sick or something happens because of the vaccine? Is, this, is the school responsible? No, I mean, the vaccine sites are not run by the their you it's part of the that. yeah yeah, yeah we it's were just not a school yeah and no child will be taken to get a vaccine it's all parent approval and parent driven so no okay joe so i had a question because uh the uh newly elected mayor uh made an announcement this morning about unmasking the kids did you hear about that i mean is there any discussion about that not yet. I know that there was a lot of talk about that over the weekend, but not yet. Okay. As I put my mask back on. <laughs> Anyone else have any more questions about the pop-up vaccination sites? Because I know that parents may have a lot of questions, as Francis said. Um, I think it's important to know that this is a citywide initiative that is part of um, Mayor de Blasio's um, an initiative to have as many of uh, to offer as many options to vaccines as possible. Um, but this is not happening at a, you know, as a school based, if your child comes to school, they're going to get a vaccine. Parents have to be part of the process. Yeah, I have to say, I had a parent um, call me very upset that saying that she couldn't believe that they're just going to vaccinate children. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, oh, no, I, I read that the parents have to be there and give yeah. like approval or written approval to someone else. It's not just, so I think that 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 should be the first thing on the paper and not in the even, middle. Yes, not I even approval. It's like the parent, the parent comes for the vaccine. Yeah, it's, and it's, they call yeah. the kid down. It's no, not they like have on the yeah. they have on the paperwork that if it's not the parent, then they that person needs to come with written permission, right. which can, yes, can right. which so can grandma, mean how do you right? But how do you really know that that's the parent if it's not notarized? So my thing is. Um, uh, I think that verbiage needs to be right at the beginning because it's in the middle or the end of the paperwork after they talk about the pop up vaccines and people, you know, for a parent to ask me that, um, that means they're not reading it. You know, not yeah, and, and, and I think it's important for us to have that information as you know, a leadership body in the district, but there's always the option to say, like, you can call your school directly or you can always call the district office and we can give parents as, you know, the information they need. But I think it's really important for them to know that because we had a couple of um, schools over the weekend where parents were saying we're not sending our child to school because we don't want them to get vaccinated. And we were saying, no, 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 that's not um, that's not what's happening. You know, it is something that is parent you know, requested, parent approved, all of those things. If there are parents who are interested in getting their children vaccinated, this is just another space that they can do that. And overall, Andy, the interest, I... the interest has been very high. Uh, yeah. And uh, a lot of parents are taking the opportunity to get vaccinated at school. Yep. yep. Lamar, you have a question? Well, Louis touched on it. I wanted to know, yeah. is there are there any early reports on the interest? Uh, is there going to be a, a gauge of how many parents will be participating? But he said it so far. So we will, I mean, right, principals right. will get access to uh, the list of students who are vaccinated. Uh, of course, it helps when they uh, when there's a positive case in school, when we identify close contacts, I need that information. Mm -hmm. It's not going to really be shared widely because of, you know, uh, health regulations. But, um, but you know, I was at PS24 today and there was about 30 families there before 8 o'clock when I left. So it's, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah. And this is how long again? Today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, or so tomorrow? it's it's uh, every school only has one vaccination clinic. So you have to go to the DOE website and find your school. But half of our schools are going today, and there's a morning time. So some schools are seven time. to eleven, 
and then there's I think twelve to four uh, this afternoon at, at different schools. So at PS twenty four, the team that was there vaccinating is leaving at eleven, and they're going to PS one twenty, and PS one twenty has it in the afternoon today. So they're only going to have it once. Uh, and again, most of our schools are having it either today or tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. I have a question. Um, do the kids go when they get vaccinated? They're getting vaccinated during school time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they get sent back to class right after they yeah. get vaccinated. Uh, Unless the parent wants to bring them home. I, I'm, I, I'm just one of those parents that I don't feel this should be in the schools. I think this should be in the doctor's office, but I, I, I'll just leave it at that. I met a little boy named Atlas today, five years old. They weren't even asking him to roll up his sleeve, but he was like, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so brave. I was like, wow, I would have been screaming at five years old. He's so brave. But yeah, they go back to class. And again, like Danielle said, the parent wants to sign them out. They follow the same protocol and they can take them home early if they wanted to. Okay, any other questions? All right, so the next piece that I want to speak about is Brilliant New York City, and I know that there has been a lot of news about Brilliant New York City, um, and there's been talk about uh, parent engagement meetings from Brilliant uh, that are around Brilliant New York City, and I think it's important for our DLT um, to know what this process is. So we are having our District 25 family engagement meeting on November 29th, Monday, November 29th at six o'clock, um, where we are going to spend a lot of time talking about what brilliant New York City can mean for District 25. And I'm actually really excited to have this conversation because as part of the conversation, um, it is about a co-creation of what, um, like re reimagining what kindergarten can look like for our district through a community lens, right? So it's around the co-creation of rigorous curriculum, project-based learning, things that we do across our district, which I'm going to speak to um, a little bit. And then it is also parent voice around certain acceleration programs that we have in District 25, one of them being our gifted and talented classes in our elementary school. So first, what I do want to say, offer is this. It's really important because the feedback that I've been seeing across communities um, after these community meetings is that um, some families feel that they did not have a voice and that um, the feedback sessions were too controlled. So one of the things that's really important to me is that families in District 25 have a voice around either asking questions, giving feedback, voicing concerns around what brilliant New York City can mean in District 25. So what I have asked is for principals, teachers, assistant principals, or other members of our community to assist us in facilitating breakout rooms, because I would like to keep them small so everyone could get a say. There will be a leader in each of the rooms and then a note taker in each of the rooms so we can compile that, which will be presented to the DLT around what the feedback we receive from the community around Brilliant New York City. So um, before I ask any of you to volunteer to be part of those rooms, <laughs> um, I do want to say last year, and I know that you heard this because it was part of the PEP, the members of the PEP voted to not approve paying for the cost of the GNT citywide uh, exam that is given for placement of students in gifted and talented programs. Because of that, the Department of Education had to find a new way by which to make referrals to place students in gifted and talented. Now, because of the pandemic and then that there was a little bit of a lag, um, it last year it went by teacher recommendation and school-based recommendation. But we all know that that is not a way for us to really truly assess placement as many of these children are coming to school for the first time and teachers are just getting to know them. So as part of the recreation of what um, 
accelerated learning will look like, they are saying that kindergarten has to be a space where we offer rigorous curriculum to all. And during that year, we use that as a time where we are seeing the brilliance in every child. Um, so, so that does mean for now that because we're not giving the gifted and talented test in fourth grade, that we will not be having one of our acceleration programs of gifted and talented in kindergarten next year. So, so that's gonna be upsetting to some of our families because we do have gifted and talented programs in five of our schools in District 25. We have them at 209, PS 79, PS 165, PS 21 and PS 32. Um, besides that, I think families are going to have a lot of questions around what that means in terms of acceleration. So I want to talk about a couple of things that we are doing in District 25 that are also accelerated programs. So first of all, this year we have um, rolled out our collaboration with Bank Street in terms of accelerated mathematics training for teachers in the early childhood classes. So we started at a small pilot group of schools and now that has expanded to all of our schools. So we're excited to continue that work because our work with Bank Street in the K to two and three grade levels prepares us for our algebra for all program, which starts in fifth grade. And then for our um, regents, accelerated regents options, which we are offering to all students, any child that um, wants to take the regents in both math and science by eighth grade. So we see that connection of acceleration where we're training our early childhood educators around like high levels of math content and math instruction at the early childhood level. Um, we also have many of our successful schools that hit the top 30 in the state and the city, schools such as um, PS 130, PS 244, um, and PSIS 499, none of these schools have gifted and talented, and yet they have high levels of performance and acceleration for our students. We also have Renzulli schools, which is in our middle school, Bell Academy, but then we also offer Renzulli-like programs, which are high levels of student choice, um, student voice and curriculum at PS 169 and PS 184, both of which have rejected offers to house gifted and talented programs in their schools for, for a long time. So I plan on talking to our community about the fact that District 25 has high expectations, high levels of, of rigor and curriculum for all students. And together, we're going to continue to build on this and give families a voice to say, what else would you want to see in this work? Dr. Mike, did I miss anything around um, what I wanted to say? So I am nope. building um, our presentation at this time, which I will send to the DLT so you can have it in advance. I see that I had sent you guys the flyers, but Lewis also put them in the chat. You are all welcome to come and be participants in this meeting, but I am also offering to any member of the DLT if they would like to run a breakout group just around ensuring that parents have voice. I'm not quieting. I'm not going to silence any parent. I feel every parent should have a right to engage in a conversation about this, but I think sometimes what the community doesn't understand is that, and I know many of you understand this as well, but some of the things that I've seen in um, community parent chat meetings are very similar to some of the things that happen on public websites, you know, on uh, social media websites. So like when you don't have to face somebody at a CEC meeting and, you know, really start saying it, you could just type in words. We do see sometimes chats become places where conversations are not about the topic, but go somewhere else. And sometimes it winds up insulting a single person or a school. And so, so we can't say when we shut down a chat for inappropriate content that we're blocking voice. We're not doing that. We're saying like, look, you can't just say whatever you want in a chat. Um, but that is why I want to make sure we have as many as possible. Um, currently, Lewis, how many people do we have that signed up for the um, so I just checked meeting. now. We have um, 124 registrants and not not. Uh, so Zoom meetings have a 300 participant cap. So it's really important if anyone is looking to participate, um, say that they register as soon as possible. 
-hmm. and uh, we're asking certain questions during registration. So anyone who is not part of our school community, we are um, we're not approving them at this time. We want to see what the uh, registration numbers look like. If obviously for under 300, we can approve everyone. But if anyone says that they're from another district or if they're from, you know, a, a community member that has no children in school, um, but we're holding off on that. But right now, 124, which is good. Yep. Yep. So. Um, I want to thank Joe and Francis. Joe is part of our CEC president and Francis is part of President's Council president. They have volunteered to run a meeting. You know, I one of the things that happens when they do that as parents is that they become facilitators and not necessarily community members who can, um, you know, of course, they can speak during the meeting, but not as much as the goal, which is to give our community as much voice as possible. So I want to thank the two of you for for volunteering to do that and then to offer anyone on the DLT an opportunity to lead a breakout session if you want. Um, you could actually just put it in the chat or email me later and we will be happy to have you as part of that. So what we're going to do is we get closer to the meeting is I'm going to call everyone together. So we have about uh, I think 13 principals, some assistant principals um, and and I will call everyone together and we will talk about what it means um, to facilitate the breakout rooms. And we're very lucky to have Lewis because he will be able to organize the technological aspect of it. So we won't get lost. He'll put everybody in the breakout rooms and and I will give everyone an agenda just about um, what the breakout room structure should look like um, and how we can you know, facilitate parent voice through that. So, OK, any questions about Brilliant New York City? So one of the things, Francis, that I did want to ask you is I also want to speak about this at PTA meetings because um, I think it's important that families understand what this is about. I mean, we could do it. We don't have to do it this month at President's Council. We could do it the next month at President's Council because this is just the beginning of the conversation and parent engagement. But I just want this out as, you know, vastly as possible across the district so the communities understand the objective around elevating curriculum and content for all students. So if we could do that, I would appreciate that. I'm going to be mentioning Joe as part of my um, meeting in uh, at CEC tomorrow night, but I will also then talk about how um, parents can come to the meeting on the 29th so they can have a voice. OK, any other questions? All right, that was easy. Um, the next piece is around the DASA survey, and I, um, I have also included something in the chat around the DASA survey. So what I can say is I think there has been some concern coming from our families around DASA um, and what it uh, how it is going to be used in our schools. So I want to preface this by saying that since I, um, since we started as districts, right? So when was that, Mike? 2015. Five, years ago. Yeah, we have been training our building leaders, our teachers, our guidance counselors, our parent coordinators in social emotional learning practices. So we were one of the first districts that took on the ruler initiative through the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, um, where we trained all of the people that I just mentioned in the use of ruler. Social emotional learning has been in the forefront of the my mission and vision for this district. So this is not social emotional learning is not something new for our teachers. Um, it is something that we have spoken to adults about that we say social emotional learning is key to academic learning because when students are not in a space where they feel comfortable, um, they can't learn. So I don't want families to think that this is just a new um, initiative that's happening. We have been administering social emotional surveys at the school level for the past two years. So. Um, so two years ago, we started as a pilot, and last year, many of our schools created social emotional, more than that, more than that yeah. created social emotional learning surveys with some students, right? Asking questions like, my teachers know when I'm upset. Um, I have somebody to go to when, you know, when 
I'm struggling. Those are really important questions that we want our students to feel about creating a warm and welcoming environment. So, so to, I just want to put out there that this is not something new. But what the DASA is, it's an observable survey that teachers observe behaviors that are connected to social emotional learning of students. That survey, those survey results do become part of, and remember when we talked about this, MTSS is not just about academics, it's also about social emotional learning. So students who may be struggling with making friends, um, coming back to school in general, we create this tiered system of supports for students. Some of it is covered in the classroom where our teachers have the strategies to target students to make sure that they are in, such as the check-ins that we do on the mood meter, to make sure that they're in a, in a place where they can come in and be ready to learn. And teachers have learned strategies, if a child says they're in a certain place, how to bring them into what we call the yellow, which is the maximal place for learning. So I know that there are some families who are opting out of DASA, and as always, we respect parents' choice, and we are doing that. Even if your child was administered the DASA survey because there was a small window to opt out to not take the DASA survey, um, and some schools have already done it. So even if your child was administered, if you opt out, then we, um, you have to contact your child's school, and they will take your child's survey results off of their data list. Um, but if not, uh, it is only used for ways that we can continue to do the work that we've been doing in District 25, and it's to support our students' social emotional learning as well as their academics. So any questions on DASA? I do, yes. Yep. More, more so an observation, I guess, than a question. Um, so the feedback from the teachers that I've spoken to, and granted, I didn't speak to 3,000, but generally from the ones I've spoken to were um, centered on some of the questions that they could not answer. I think with, you know, the other social, social emotional aspects that we've done in the district, it's kind of like school generated or it's teacher generated or it's student generated. So you can kind of, for lack of a better word, you can kind of dictate what you're trying to elicit and what you're trying to get. Right. I think that's somewhat fair to say, but there were questions that some of the staff members felt they just could not answer, you know, like um, general, there was one, um, something to the effect of, you know, uh, my students discuss their future, you know, something like that. I'm paraphrasing. Um, mm -hmm. We're seven weeks into the year, eight weeks into the year. And I don't know if they've had that conversation yet and they've said the same thing. And if there were other questions that they just could not answer, there wasn't an NA option, right? Mm -hmm. it went from every to moderate to rarely. So the, the the concern that some folks was was the validity and the accuracy of some of the questions that they could not answer and whether that would hold any weight going forward. So so remember what we we have talked about just in terms of our screeners and even in the ways that we use state exams, right? Um, when we unpack data and how students scored in certain areas or, or what data is telling us, that is the time to engage in conversations around exactly what you're saying, Lamar. So if we see that there are inconsistencies in how those que certain questions were answered or data is extremely low because somebody was saying something like it's rarely happened, um, for teachers to come together and say that's not something that we're really considering because, um, you know, we've only been in here for, you know, six weeks and we're not really talking about future. We're kind of actually sort of move, trying to move out of the past, right? Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be something that we would provide MTSS for it um, in particular. But what we can say from a question like that is, you know, we know that if we're talking about expectations of college and career readiness, then what are some of the things that we could do to get kids to talk about their future? You know, and, and how do we encourage opportunities to say when you're in sixth grade or when you're in eighth grade or when you go to high school, you know, so so that is actually part of something to be said about what happens in terms of individual conversations at the school level to say, like, do we do that? Because we know the importance of that. I mean, from when my kids were little, I was always talking about college with them. I was like, when you apply to go to college, when you apply to go to college, and you know, when I talk about Dylan all the time where he was a struggling learner, him not going to college wasn't even an option even for him, 
because of all the, the time I spent talking about his future. So we that question is there to kind of flag for all of us, like, are we doing this? And if not, how can we incorporate it into yeah. some of the learning that we need to do? And I think that's especially typical in, in survey-based type of, of, of assessments. It's, you know, I always say, share with our counselors and with our building leaders that it becomes a snapshot. And then it's our responsibility to kind of do some of that follow-up on what we do see or maybe perhaps need a little bit more information on. And I think that's that's the goal of of surveys is to give you that snapshot of information so that you can then take the next steps to support the kids. Okay, any other questions around DASA? So Joe, I'm also gonna be speaking about that as well from that lens, not to say that parents shouldn't be voicing their concerns. I've seen a lot of emails that are going into the principals and we've just basically said, if they don't want their surveys to be used, then you know we kind of take them out of that space. But because we have the experience of working with social emotional learning for many years, um, we are spinning it as a tool to use to not only support kids, but to see what may be missing from our school communities to further support our warm and welcoming environment goals and expectations. Okay. Um, the next piece, uh, so I talked about brilliant New York City. I talked about vaccination. Okay, so, oh, I'm running through this really quickly. So parent-student chats are happening across our schools. Um, I want to encourage anyone, both from uh, across all constituencies, to take part in this work if possible. Um, we have specifically asked that um, we want our communities to gain an understanding that parent chats are not workshops. They're not workshops that are run by parent coordinators or school members where you're given information. It's about hearing from you and how we can craft questions. Um, that give parents and students opportunities for voice across our communities. So we know that um, a lot of our schools are working through questions that they are going to, to be talking students through. I've been trying to model some of our parent chats as I've been going into schools to do PPOs. Um, one of the parent chats that I modeled the other day was we have only one school in the district that does not offer um, math regions. They offer science, but they don't offer the math regions. So I met with um, parents from that that school and started talking to them about building capacity and working together to support expectations for students where we would offer that and what goes into um, having that collaboration between our parents and our schools to support our students to take to have more access to math regents should they want to, because when we do that, then students have more choices in high school, right? So I told you that my daughter, who you would never imagine, um, is now taking physics in 11th grade because she had that opportunity to take that class in eighth grade. Um, so it really has offered her opportunities to take more advanced placement classes that are supporting her in her application to college. So. So we're gonna to continue to do that. And um, as always, I uh, ask that members of our DLT, um, you know, really promote this as part of, um, you know, the work that and expectations for our schools. Okay, um, finally, conversations about um, our SLT training. And I did want some feedback from you. I know Gus, you were going to, um, uh, ask about uh, citywide training, correct? Yes, uh, I uh, went in during the um, beginning of this meeting and I asked uh, the uh, person who is involved with this uh, and he asked me to send the latest um, uh, PowerPoint that I have uh, mm -hmm. and he's going to take a look at it and uh, chances are they're going to um, update it. But I don't think they're going to do a citywide webinar. At least I haven't been told that. I think it's up to us, as in the past, to do our own training. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess we'll do it online uh, because most things nowadays are online. And we can um, uh, use their template. Or um, uh, in the past, what you've done is you've taken some of it and added to it. Yep. Well, 
Um, okay, so there's a couple of things that I want to that I wanted to kind of present to try to do. Um, so the first thing is I was hoping that Lewis would be able to do something around setting up an SLT website so their meetings and their documents can be public the same way our DLT website is available to the, the public because they um, they are bound by the same open meetings law. So in order to do that, and I know that Lewis made a really nice webinar for the city, but to have that be part of some of the training that we do. Um, I know a lot of times we really kind of spoke to the SLT and I didn't want to do that. I did want to make it sort of a meet and greet um, and then maybe just like opportunities for them to give them documents for their training. They could train amongst themselves. I don't know. Um, if they're going to be using the same webinars that they used last year, Gus, I think we can, um, you know, we can maybe ask and get further clarification on that because I definitely believe that our SLTs need training, especially now. I mean, it's been a long time. We didn't do it last year. Um, there are new parents, new teachers to the work, and I want them to know the, you know, the culture of what SLT should be. So, um, a655 is also in the process of getting revised. So, um, you know, I'm sure that uh, there will be a rollout on that as well. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is, and, and this is really up to us as a DLT, do you want to wait? Do you want to aim for January? Is there, you know, a time frame that I think we should um, start training our SLTs? I think they... I don't want to just leave them out there, um, you know, just in terms of topics and um, data and goal setting and all of those different things. I wanted us to be out there in support of our SLTs, but I wanted feedback from the team. And let me just uh, say that uh, whatever you uh, decide to do, I will, um, you know, play a major role whether it's um, for all schools or groups of schools, however you want to do it. Okay. Um, I think this is Shirley, Queens High School. I think that we should start as soon as, you know, as we can, um, because of, there's a lot of new parents that's sitting on those school leadership team. Um, mm -hmm. And as soon as we get um, them up and functioning the way they should be, the better for us, you know, us, I mean, the, the school communities. Um, because again, the SLTs also um, help establish the school culture as well um, in, in, the, in individual schools. That's okay. my opinion. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to add to Shirley? All right. So I, I agree with what Shirley is saying. Um, so is there anyone who would be against us aiming for a January training? Because it is going to take some time for us to get all of this information compiled from Central. Gus, if you can get us as much as possible and if you can get us a timeline on A655, because if they're going to redo A655, we wouldn't want to do a training prior to that, um, because then we would kind of have to go back in and make some corrections as to what they're redoing. Do you know what they're aim they're looking at in terms of, of modifying A655 or no? Well, I know that they've uh, added PAC uh, as okay. a uh, mandated because remember the old one did not. I put in a request about DC uh, 37. Uh, I don't know uh, whether that request was added, uh, um, you know, acted upon or not, um, but um, and I know that recently, uh, you may know something about this, that the um, parent, um, uh, the PA, PTA uh, regs were revised. And I think they've issued those already. So what I'm going to do what, after this meeting is I'm going to shoot Andrea Ferguson uh, an email who is our liaison to mm -hmm. face and see whether I can get any, uh, you know, clarity. Uh, but I did uh, speak to uh, one of my colleagues here who uh, recently issued uh, a, I have a revised Title I training uh, PowerPoint. 
uh, and I asked whether we were uh, going to do a revised SLT training PowerPoint. And the response I got was, well, send send it to me and we'll we'll look at it. So um, I will act upon those two items, but um, it's not just District 25. I know that there's an, a need, uh, at least throughout Queens, uh, for, um, you know, SLT support because we do have, you know, uh, a lot of turnover, new, yep. new members, new principals, uh, all kinds of change. Yep. So, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I've been involved in this for many years, uh, supporting uh, all of the districts. So um, it's on my, uh, uh, you know, a list of things uh, that I expect to be doing to be part of it as uh, we uh, as the academic year goes forward. Yep. OK, mm -hmm. so I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I have updates because I'm actually on both of those working groups for right. A16 and A655. Um, A655 is, is, is behind now. They had made proposed changes to go to public comment, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's being delayed. We have to go back to the drawing group board because they were aiming for approval by the PEP in December. So it's, okay. it's being pushed back. Um, as versus the A660 updates, there is still in public comment. The, the PEP is supposed to vote on them on the 17th of this month. So those changes are not in force yet until the PEP make their decision um, if they're gonna approve those changes. But the only thing with the A655, I think that really will affect um, the train, which really shouldn't affect the training because they've been encouraged that the SLTs try to um, revise their bylaws to include the PAC chair as one uh -huh. of the parents. And that's one of the main primary changes to the A655 is um, the okay. Title One PAC chair is going to be part of the SLT, um, one of their mandatory um, positions. So as in regards to us training on the overall school leadership team, the changes of A655 is just going to be about the makeup, not not um, about consensus or anything principal to make the SLT function. So all right, can, um, also, I'm glad we have Shirley. She's a yeah. good resource so, for us. Thank you, so, so that means we should wait for a six five five, Shirley. Okay, yeah. So no, then that's good. Then we can. All right. So so then, is there anyone who would be against running an after school training from maybe um, three to four thirty? It depends which day for me. My schedule okay. changes. Um. So let me just try to get into my calendar, see where. So do you think we could, uh, actually, Lewis, is there, you know what we could do? I'm going to have Lewis uh, send you guys a calendar for January. And if you can just fill in some of those spaces and we'll look to see um, who has consensus and I'll offer up a, a date. I just think um, it would be a lot easier for schools to not have to cover their teachers. And um, so if we offer it from three to 4.30, we can engage in that work. So during this month, Gus and I will put together some training documents, overall training documents. Um, if everyone is in agreement, I would really like to have Lewis do that presentation um, in terms of you know, how to set up a website for SLT to make things public, um, you know, remotely and virtually so people can really log in and get access to the documents that are being that are able to be public and that are discussed at um, SLT meetings. And then if there's any other um, besides the centralized training and the meet and greet where I really want our SLTs to to know the DLT and to know that we're a resource for them. If there's any other topics that we would want to include in our SLT training, um, you can let me know today, or you know we could feel free to to talk about it during um, the next couple of weeks. And then when we put together our presentation for everyone's approval, um, you know we can make sure that every everything that anybody wanted to say is included. So are we okay with waiting until January? Okay, yes. Oh, good. Yes, yes, Thank yes. You. All right, we in consensus? We have consensus. Excellent. I'm, re I'm actually really excited about the training. And I'm really excited, Shirley, that you have uh, inside information that we uh, 
So thank you. And I also see that you volunteered to facilitate a breakout room. And so thank you for that. Okay. Um, all right, so the next piece for me, all of my topics are finished. What I am going to do is uh, turn this over to Gus because I know he was going to spend some time talking about the consolidated application for ESSA funded programs, but he's also going to talk about the new DCEP template that came out. And then following that, um, Mike is going to do the first bullet on our agenda, which is we had to slightly revise some of our goals to align it to the expectations of the new D DCEP template. So following Gus's presentation around the new template, Mike is going to show you how we modified some of our goals to fit in there and just to get some feedback from you guys around that. So Gus, I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. Um, uh, Lewis, should I try to share that one pager or are you going to do it? If you could share, Gus, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, let me get it up. Okay. I guess you have my, my screen. Yeah, Gus, you just have to. Okay, there you go. Okay. Everybody see it? Okay. Great. Uh, you know, those of you who have been on the um, DLT uh, for some time, uh, this will be familiar to you. We normally do it either the first or the second meeting. Um, the consolidated plan is the plan, citywide plan, that the city gives to the state to show them what we're doing with uh, the supplemental funds, particularly Title I, which is the largest amount of money that schools receive uh, besides the, uh, the, the um, um, uh, tax levy funds. Uh, and all of the other title programs. So the, the state requires that the city provide evidence that uh, the various constituencies have been consulted about uh, the consolidated plan. Now, uh, the way we've done consulting for many, many years is uh, by giving the DLT members a, a one page overview and making the draft of the plan available to the uh, superintendent's office in case uh, DLT members want to actually read it or go into the details. Um, the um, page numbers for each section are indicated in this document and everybody should have it. Now, um, on the second um, uh, uh, row, uh, it says consultation signature pages. In the past, we've circulated that um, not very uh, user friendly form uh, with those little boxes that people have had to fill out. Um, the state is allowing us not to uh, uh, submit that with actual signatures this time around. So what I've been told is that they will accept your uh, attendance sheet. Um, I have to provide the agenda, the minutes and the attendance sheet, which I will uh, I will copy the names and the constituencies from the attendance sheet, type them into the Title I form, and I'm told that the state is going to accept that this time around. And I will, um, if um, anybody wants to review the actual document, uh, that cannot be either duplicated or distributed, but I can email it to the superintendent, and then uh, this district office can make arrangements for somebody to come in or you know whatever works uh, without it being copied or distributed uh, to actually review it. In my experience, very few people uh, in um, all of my DLTs have ever wanted to see the actual document. It's a um, uh, kind of technical document. Um, what um, uh, most people are interested in, ladies and gentlemen, is they're interested in the actual money. Uh, most people want to know, well, how much do, does my school get or the schools in District 25 get in general. All of the monies for every one of these programs that's listed here, Title I basic being the biggest, uh, but uh, also you'll see the uh, Students in Temporary Housing, which is the third row down, are uh, publicly available to every penny. Um, and they're based on uh, uh, poverty criteria or other criteria um, most of the schools 
but not all of the schools in District 25 are Title I eligible. It, it's based on um, uh, uh, poverty rates having to do with lunch forms uh, that are still being used uh, to determine levels of poverty. Uh, and uh, the only thing that I would point out to people who have heard all of this before is for reasons unknown to me, the DOE changed the SAM uh, that stands for School Allocation Memorandum that Title I is uh, outlined in and all the money is, is outlined in. For many, many years, as long as I've been doing this, it was always SAM 8. Now they changed it to SAM 11. So if you want to check on your particular school or all District 25 schools and how much money they're getting and what the criteria are, you go to SAM 11. And each one of these programs has a particular SAM. But the one that uh, relates to most schools uh, and um, that has the majority of the money is SAM 11 because it has the STH and it has the um, uh, Title I basic. So um, uh, I'm going to go through this as I have in the past. And um, the uh, 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 bullets give you the content of uh, what's uh, in the actual narrative. Uh, and um, uh, the um, uh, 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 STH it stands for Students in Temporary Housing. That is uh, monies that uh, both non-Title I and Title I uh, schools get if they have the population. How does a school know if they have the population? Well, it's in ATS, Automate the Schools, and there's a particular code. Now, what's important for parents to know is that every school should have a sign uh, that indicates that this money is available to help students that have been displaced. And it's not just for students that are in homeless shelters. It's students that have been di displaced for various reasons. Um, as our superintendent knows, a number of years ago, we had Superstore uh, Storm Sandy, and um, uh, lots of people who had never been displaced before were displaced. And um, the state and the city did a special allocation to help uh, students uh, citywide uh, who needed funds. What are the funds used for? They used for uh, helping with school supplies, sometimes even clothing, um, to go on school trips when trips uh, were in person, um, uh, for all kinds of other necessary supplies. There is a website. Uh, uh, attached to the allocation memorandum uh, and I believe um, the the, um, uh, the the number now is 11 so that's an error there in the in the link uh, I'll have to tell them to update that um, because uh, Sam 11 is now where all of those uh, title one and STH funds are available and uh, it tells you what the money can be used for there are also uh, STH liaisons for every borough. Um, if uh, anybody uh, wants to know, I can get you the name of the person who is the STH liaison for District 25. And what uh, I've been involved sort of at the micro level on this, because after Super, Superstorm Sandy, for example, they uh, the state came in and monitored um, selectively schools and including some schools in District 25. And I was part of the um, in-house team that helped the principal. The principal keeps records when they uh, use this funds. And the state came in and asked them, OK, you got X amount of dollars and it's per capita. Um, the amount used to be one hundred and one dollars per student. I don't know whether that's changed or not, but that's what it used to be. And uh, it depends on the number of students that are coded in ATS to receive this funds. And it changes from year to year that the funds are made available. Now, uh, uh, any any questions on uh, STH uh, or the consolidated plan so far? Remember, it's a citywide plan. If not, I'll I'll move on. A lot of you are veterans and have heard this before. Okay, uh, Title One is uh, the uh, I call it the extra help. Um, amount of money that's available for uh, schools. Uh, as um, uh, you may know, uh, it's a state law 
that every school in the city and in the state of New York um, have they have to provide extra help to students in need. So uh, uh, District 26, one of our neighboring districts, has very few Title I eligible schools. They don't get the extra money, but they still have to provide the extra help. So the extra help has to be provided, and that's what uh, is in the MTSS section, uh, in the AIS section of school plans. So it's the extra help program that's done that supplements either the, during the school day, before the school day, after the school day, and uh, schools have um, various choices on how they deliver the, that extra help uh, to students that are determined to be in academic need. And it differs from school to school. Uh, in some schools uh, that uh, have very few or no level ones or level twos, um, it's uh, different criteria that um, they use to help students in need. But um, uh, it is a state law and the Title I funds are very substantial, particularly for larger schools. And um, it's very important that schools continue to uh, administer those um, uh, lunch forms, even though they may be getting, you know, in, in middle school, they have universal, you know, lunch, everybody eats. But um, those forms are important in determining the poverty level. I don't believe they've changed the, the, the way they go about it. And if a school um, uh, falls below the, uh, the uh, borough cutoff, which changes every year, uh, then they may lose the funds. Uh, and so um, there, sometimes there are hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, at stake. Usually there are hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake. So principals are aware of this and it's very important. There's a, um, uh, that's all, all about Title I. And if you want to know what st schools are doing with the money, if you want to know how much money they get, you go to SAM 11. If you want to know what they're doing with the money, you go to the uh, CEP and look at their uh, M MTSS uh, and uh, whatever is described in the action plan and you'll see how they're helping students most uh, academic need. And if um, uh, Title I training is needed, um, it, this relates to PAC and relates to the uh, annual meeting, which was supposed to be held by the end of October, where principals in Title I schools uh, explain to parents what they're doing with the funds. And it also, um, there's a 1% set aside for parent um, support of that those extra health programs. Uh, and um, there is special training and a special PowerPoint, which we've done in District 25 on an ad needed, uh, as needed basis uh, to help explain those programs. And I get questions all the time from principals. Sometimes new principals come in and they, uh, they have questions about administering those funds. Uh, and uh, I, I feel those questions. And our main support from a fiscal point of view is Dragomira uh, Koliva, who's very excellent. She's one of the senior uh, uh, senior grants officers in the city at this point. And uh, I have been collaborating with her for many years and she also has participated in our trainings. So um, if you go to page 14, there's a homeless student program information chart for the entire city. Um, the the uh, fiscal information, those uh, charts, uh, by DBN, they're the same as in SAM 11. Uh, I have to speak to them and tell them to change that number. Uh, they apparently didn't know uh, that it changed. Uh, I know because I get asked Title I questions all the time, and Dragomira was kind enough to send me the new SAM and tell me that the number has changed. Uh, then there's uh, uh, neglected and delinquent facilities chart, uh, which uh, indicates where monies go um, for um, uh, 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 schools that get those special funds uh, and uh, uh, neglected and uh, 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 delinquent youth programs. Um, those are middle school and, and especially high school programs. Um, uh, in the majority, uh, they're all described on those pages. Um, the high school folks know about ABC and um, uh, other programs. Uh, if anybody has any specific questions, 
Um, uh, I'm sure my uh, colleague, um, um, Bill Doyle, uh, who is a high school person, uh, will tell you what the latest terminology is, because um, when I uh, was involved in uh, helping administer those programs, some of the titles have changed, but um, they're basically to help um, uh, um, uh, students in those categories. Now, um, Title Three is about uh, recruiting professional development, early uh, grade, uh, grade class child reduction, uh, especially uh, elementary schools are very um, familiar with those and consider those class size reductions very important. Those are in SAM 26, so you can see what schools get. Uh, and um, uh, the bullets tell you, uh, if you read the narrative, what those funds are being used for. Uh, Title three is uh, the L supplemental for uh, supplemental services. And uh, in, uh, in I plan, you can see the uh, program, the L Title III program, that if a school qualifies, they have to uh, put in a description. Uh, it's part of the CEP uh, in I plan. Uh, in order to get those, those funds, folks, you have to have 30 or more L's. So uh, I've been contacted by schools in the past and said, well, Gus, I, I didn't get that money. And we've looked it up and they had 29 this year or you know they had 25 and whereas the other year they had 31 so it changes from year to year and you have to make sure uh, that uh, you have those funds uh, to um, to qualify um, title three immigrant funds are interesting they are different from the uh, program uh, that I just mentioned and the qual uh, the qualifications are a little different they're on that SAM what those are for is certain schools get an influx of immigrants. So uh, that changes from year to year. And um, uh, if they get an influx of immigrants uh, and there is a coding in ATS for all of that, then they get these special funds. I've been contacted by principals in the past who said, Gus, I got um, immigrant, you know, title funds. Uh, Title III funds uh, last year, but I didn't get them this year. And when I've inquired, I, um, you know, Dragomira and um, the uh, L folks have told me, well, the numbers changed. That was because of special circumstances on that particular year. But uh, those circumstances didn't apply uh, for this this year. Uh, so um, Title IV is related to STH. Um, there's uh, STEM and civics. Uh, and international baccalaureate program um, and has to do with chronic uh, absenteeism. Uh, it is um, mostly um, a central allocation that schools benefit from. Uh, and um, uh, they're also the COVID uh, programs, um, for example, supportive environment. Remember when the access to technology, that's where they took the monies uh, from they probably added to them as well to distribute all those computers that they did last year. So um, that's where that money is. Uh, and on page 40, there's an interesting thing that those of you who are veterans will hear, hear me speak about. Um, th the city is required to hold uh, sessions, uh, and there's a special office at Central that does this for private schools in every geographic area. So um, in, um, uh, in, in District 25, um, the private Catholic schools, uh, yeshivas, uh, any other schools, um, uh, the uh, Greek schools, St. Nicholas, etc., they are entitled to title funds. And um, they, a, a, a special meeting is held to explain to them um, that uh, what they're entitled to and the office at Central um, uh, 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 it helps advise them on obtaining those funds. And we have to submit to the state uh, proof that those meetings were held. Again, I was involved in this in the past, so I know that uh, we have to spend, uh, send this big spreadsheet to the state, which tells them, um, you know, which uh, um, um, in each geographic area, which uh, uh, private uh, and parochial schools um, uh, were contacted, 
when meetings were held and what the attendance was. So that's what that's all about. And then the budgets and narratives and submission information is there. Um, um, uh, uh, Title V uh, has various uh, pro, uh, um, about uh, professional level administrative and supervisory positions um, and the funding sources. Again, um, that these are citywide documents and there are details in there. So um, that really, I just wanted to go through it. I, we do this every year uh, and I will type in your name um, that um, uh, this uh, presentation constitutes uh, consultation. And like I said, if anybody has a, a, a great desire to read the actual document, I will um, uh, uh, email it to the superintendent's office. Uh, any questions on this, folks? Comments? I guess not. Okay. Um, uh, okay, everybody. I'll turn to the, uh, the DCP. And um, this is a overview that I was given to, uh, given by Central. Uh, that I added some slides to. Um, so uh, the overview uh, talks about doing the consolidated plan, which I've just done. Uh, it tells you that you have the, um, and you have this PowerPoint, by the way, and you also have the new DCP template. Uh, the DCP, this tells you that it's required. Um, it mentions the TSI schools, um, as uh, um, uh, I'm sure Bill Doyle will also mention, we have a uh, the, our first TSI visit with Flushing High School. Um, uh, I believe it's this week. Um, uh, maybe it's tomorrow or Wednesday. Uh, and um, uh, they're continuing in the same status. Uh, and uh, District 25 is a, um, a, a district in need of improvement uh, because of that one school. The, um, Flushing has made tremendous progress, and we're hopeful that once the the state uh, begins uh, uh, using um, uh, the standardized uh, uh, criteria, testing criteria again, uh, and um, no one's told me this, but um, I expect that this year they will probably use it as a baseline, and the following year make some decisions uh, that hopefully Flushing will um, uh, get off of the list. There'll be no new identifications to District 25, and so you'll be able to join District 26 in being a school, um, a district uh, uh, in good standing. That's my hope, ladies and gentlemen. So we only have uh, one TSI school. Uh, uh, the um, DCP template um, has been revised. Uh, it is very different than it was um, um, uh, the one that we just uh, completed and um, is being posted, um, has been posted. Uh, the, um, uh, there's a new, uh, the overview section is back. And the good news is that uh, some of you may know uh, a gentleman by the name of Richard Bellis. I am uh, collaborating with him and uh, he's gonna give me um, information for updating your overview. So uh, I expect to get new, new information about the number of uh, L's, uh, number of special ed students, um, how many schools we have, all of that good basic information that we always put into the overview uh, and will um, overview. Uh, and we have the district mission, um, uh, the uh, 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 continuous improvement planning section is where there is a, uh, a complete redesign. We won't be using AOCs, uh, areas of concentration anymore. Uh, and I expect that that will migrate also into the new CEPs, although I have not been given a new CEPs. I'll talk about CEPs br briefly at the end of my presentation. So uh, MTSS, we've already discussed, and that is a uh, uh, the uh, extra help section that's in there. Um, visits, as, as you can see here, will be taking place uh, throughout the year, and uh, Bill Doyle and I are collaborating uh, with the district team and flushing on that, and we'll continue to do so. Thank God we have no receivership schools, so that doesn't apply to us. Um, this is information about the uh, Title I 
um, required meeting and the PAC. Um, the various dates are here. Uh, and um, the PAC, I've spoken to uh, uh, the district leadership team and Esther and um, her colleagues have assured me that the PAC uh, is in process and uh, we will meet uh, the uh, deadline date. Uh, and by the way, uh, I'm very proud of District 26. You always meet every deadline date. Uh, for as long as I've been working with you, you are um, uh, excellent. Uh, and um, in fact, very often you're the first district in the entire city to meet certain deadlines. So that's our record in District 25, and the, you will continue, I'm sure, to meet that record of excellence. And here are some links to information, as I said. So we've already begun developing the DCP uh, as usual. Uh, the um, uh, district team is ahead and uh, has anticipated a lot of the changes uh, there. Uh, the main changes is that uh, the um, uh, new uh, configuration, and I added the next two slides myself. What I did was what I, I went into the template and pulled out these sections from uh, the template uh, and, uh, and put them in. So um, uh, the way it's designed is the district has to come up with an overarching priority aligned to the 21-22 instructional uh, priorities. Um, and equity uh, and disproportionality are key elements uh, in everything that we're doing. Uh, an equity lens, lens, as it says here, and disproportionality. You see those two words, equity and disproportionality. Remember those two terms, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the bywords. So there are six academic priorities uh, and we have to write an area of focus uh, and an outcome goal and what are called process goals. So it, um, there are more goals. There's a outcome goal and there are process goal for each one of these six pieces. So um, it's focusing in on early childhood literacy, uh, ensuring a culturally relevant and sustaining curriculum in every school, developing our students as digital citizens, investing in special education. And by the way, that special education uh, fine presentation uh, that we just heard relates both to the uh, consolidated plan and to uh, this part of the DCEP. Um, providing greater support for our multilingual learners uh, and their families and ensuring our students are college and career ready. In the old one, only the high schools really had to do a separate goal for college and career readiness. Now everyone uh, is doing it. And it's the philosophy is there should be alignment from elementary school and actions and activities uh, from elementary school and particularly alignment between uh, middle school and high school in terms of college and career readiness. Now, uh, a lot of this you already have done uh, because of uh, the excellent um, uh, work that you've done in the past and uh, the way your um, district team operates, you already have a lot of these pieces already in place. It's just a matter of moving things around and putting them in the uh, in, in, in the various places uh, that they fit and add yeah, to uh, Mike, Mike has already done that, so he can show them that. Right. That's see, okay. That's why you're 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 excellent. Uh, so uh, the other piece that I thought everybody should be familiar with is that uh, there is uh, the design of the DCP. And like I said, this is going to also relate to the CEPs as well. Um, it is based on what's called an equity goal setting template. And it gives you here the logic uh, that everybody should be applying when they think of putting together goals and the action plans. So I thought it would be good for people to see these various steps and, uh, and, and be familiar with them in a, a kind of theoretical way. Now, uh, I did not anticipate taking up a lot of time and going over the actual um, uh, template. Uh, do I need to do that, um, uh, Danielle, or uh, will we do that? No, no, because Mike, Mike will, Mike will show it to them. Okay, that's what I, that's what I, I figured. So, uh, uh, 
uh, I'll take any questions, but um, without um, further ado, I'm basically, you know, done. Uh, let me see how I can get out of here and get back to stop sharing. Ah, good. Boy, I'm learning technology all the time. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Lewis, and uh, and and Mike, uh, and Mike, you can take over. Uh, and if there, anybody has any questions that occur, yeah, I have a I have a question, Gus. It's sure. Francis. In the beginning, you were praising uh, District 26. I think you meant District 25. I mentioned, uh, yeah. Okay, I just want to be. I just want to make sure that we're Thank not getting you, credit Way to go, for Francis. District 26. You know. I just want to make sure that District 25 is on point because you did say District 26. I was a little confused. I just want to make sure you weren't confused. Okay. He was confused, Francis. Way to go, Francis. We have, we have a, uh, a friendly competition between my Queens districts, and you're all uh, excellent, and you vary being number one or number two in the city and getting everything done. So I meant District 25. I think you were number one last time in, in, uh, in getting uh, CPs completed, for example. Uh, but it, it varies from year to year. But um, uh, you, your, your record is, is stellar. And... Um, uh, I'm very proud of you, as I am of uh, 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 all of my my uh, Queens North districts. Uh, I, I like just want to have a friendly competition between you. I just wanted to make it clear in the minutes. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Flip of the tongue. <laughs> okay, guys. So thank you for that, Gus. And um, I will I will definitely go through just a, a couple of the realignments. Uh, that we made just to, to ensure that our goals uh, do connect to uh, the new uh, the new template that we've been just uh, that's just been shared with us. So uh, fortunate for us, we do a lot of the things that we were planning do connect nicely into this new template. Uh, but we do want your feedback to, in the event that you don't see that alignment or you don't believe that we've connected the goals in the most appropriate way. Um, in connection to those academic priorities that the chancellor has uh, has shared with us. Um, so just before I do that, though, I want to kind of run through um, our most current data from the iReady assessment that our kids have taken. I'm just going to show you a few slides for ELA, a few slides for math, just to give you the overall context. Uh, that way that you can then see where we've aligned that and made those connections still into our current goals. Um, so you'll, I'll, I'll do it quickly. I know that sometimes looking at, at charts can be a little bit blah. Um, so I won't do too many of them, but I want to make sure you have the most current information um, in relationship to our district data. Um, so here we go. Just a quick uh, agenda diagnostic assessment data. We're going to talk about iReady reading, iReady math, um, give you a quick little rundown of where we are as a district at this point. Um, as of 11-2 uh, was the last run that I did just as I was creating this presentation. Uh, there were 14,883 students in grades, K th in grades 3 through 8 uh, that completed the iReady reading assessment. These are the current student number of students across subgroups uh, that completed the assessment as of 11-2. Um, just bear in mind in grades K through 2, uh, the children did not take the iReady. They took the Acadians assessment. Uh, more information on that one will be following um, for you guys to see a little bit about how our kids are doing in those basic skills um, in the early childhood grades. Um, at any rate, this is what our current breakdown is. Uh, the iReady assessment, just to kind of refresh everyone, assesses children on phonemic awareness, phonics, high frequency words, vocabulary, comprehension of literature, and comprehension of informational text. Um, and here's basically the, the breakdown. And let me go into present mode so you can see the charts a little bit better. Um, what the bit data basically says in, in a nutshell, uh, we had 35% of our students that are currently on or above grade level at the beginning of the year. Now, reminder, this is an assessment that's be, that was administered in October. So we're not expecting that all of our kids are already above grade level. Uh, we would like certainly our children to be on um, early on grade level uh, at this point. Um, but this is currently where we are. We're in a place where we have 35% of our children that are on or above. The largest percentage of our children that are currently multiple grade levels below 
on this particular assessment um, are within grades five through eight, as you can see in the um, eighth, seventh, sixth, and fifth grade. Those are our largest chunks of children that are in that two or more grade levels below as compared to children in grades three and four. Wait, Mike, can I yeah. just want to, um, as he's going through this, I, I just want to say, Mike and I have started our PPOs where we're going into schools with this data. And what we're basically saying is when we're talking about MTSS, which you will see as part of our goal setting, and you have seen it as part of our goal setting um, from when we first started talking about goals over the summer. But, you know, a lot of schools, when they think MTSS, they think of those that additional layer right? So of how do we do small groups or after school or um, RTI where students are sort of outside of the classroom receiving services. But when you're looking at things, and, and I will say this to you, and we all know this, this 35 is going to jump very high um, for when we go to our mid-year benchmarks um, because we're actually targeting this work now. But what I do want to say is the conversation that Mike and I have been having with principals is that when you have 35% of your kids that are scoring this way, our expectation is that a lot of this instruction is targeted through tier one. So it's how are you working with teachers so they have a handle on the data and what that says? How are they going into units of study where they're looking at key standards that I already shows that are areas of weakness? And how are they modifying their lessons to make sure that they're hitting these targets with certain classes, right? So one year I may have a class that may have be struggling with, um, uh, the, the fiction over nonfiction, right? And then the following year, the class may be struggling over nonfiction over fiction. So it's about how I elevate and plan within my units of study to, to target where my kids are at that time. So we've been really pushing, like we teach kids, not content, right? Content is part of, of our work. We're content specialists, but we teach children. So so that's what we, we've really been pushing tier one work um, with all of our principals. So yeah. you can see that in the goals. Yeah, and, and the, the other part about these percentages is that that's exactly what they are. They're just percentages. So our our push is also that we're very clear on not only what these percentages are, but the students that live within them um, across our schools, across our classrooms, so that our building leaders know who are our children that, that live in this in this range right now of, of the one, two, three grade levels below, just as much as they know who's on and above. You know, so it's about knowing who these kids are and then making those appropriate um, ensuring that the appropriate supports are available to them uh, in the classroom. Okay. Um, whoops, did I skip one? I think I oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Clicked too too fast. Uh, so this is the same data based on demographic breakdown. Uh, what you'll see here is the the largest percentage of uh, of students, the highest percentage of of, of students at a subgroup that are currently on or above grade level is our multiracial subgroup. Now we do not have a very large multiracial subgroup. Uh, in District 25, but nonetheless, they, they currently have the, the most significant percentage of children that are on or above. Uh, our Black, Hispanic, and other subgroups had the greatest percentage of students that are two or more grade levels below at 55, 52, and 60, 64 percent um, in, in, within those subgroups. And as you can see up at the top, it starts off with our Asian population, followed by our Black, Hispanic, multiracial, and so on. And you can see that those red and orange bars are indicative of children that are currently two or more grade levels below. Now, the other subgroup you should know is a very, very small percentage of our total population in the district, a fraction of, of a percent, uh, but you will see that on here uh, nonetheless. And what you will also see is that within this particular uh, data poll, that the subgroup that we have emphasized inside of our goals uh, certainly represent what we're seeing inside of this data as well at the beginning of the year iReady assessment um, within the context of our Black and Hispanic subgroups as subgroups that we are identifying inside of our goals uh, and within our uh, expectations for our schools that we're really monitoring and supporting um, these subgroups. Uh, our students with disabilities, again, another um, another piece of information that we are um, paying attention to, not only here inside of the data that I'm showing you, but also represented in our goals. The, the, the grade level that had the highest percentage of children amongst our students with disabilities uh, that are in that on or above grade level is our grade three students. 
around 21%, and that's roughly around where our children uh, tend to be, around that 21% uh, for our students with disabilities that are on grade level by the end of the year, uh, which is something obviously we want to continue to improve upon. But what you should see here is what happens across grade levels from grade three all the way up through grade eight. You see that there is a more significant percentage of our children that are currently two or more grade levels below when they get into the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade comparatively to when they are in grades three and four. Uh, so part of that MTSS work that, that Superintendent Domango mentioned is really part of what we're doing with in the context of that special ed recovery programs, uh, as well as the work that they're doing uh, inside of their classrooms to support our children with special needs. So this is a, a really important com uh, data component for us as a district and one that we're gonna continue to emphasize during our school visits as well. Uh, and our English language learners, you're going to see a similar pattern as to what we, we traditionally see. Um, our children in the earlier grades um, tend to be fewer grade levels below than what you would see when we start getting into the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Now, in large part to, to this, our L's um, that, we're, that we're referencing here in the upper grades are children that, remember, once our children test out, they're no longer necessarily connected into this data as they would be. Uh, earlier on. So, so a number of these children in grades six, five, six, seven, and eight are children that are also new L's. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily represent what's happening for our children across years, particularly when they are uh, testing in the earlier grade levels. Now you will see K1 and 2 are in here. It's a very small percentage of those children, uh, as some schools did give our L's this assessment too um, for, for our younger kids. So um, needless to say, this is an area that we are also attending to with, with training supports for our teachers um, as well. Any quick questions about the ELA, uh, the reading data before I move on I into am. the math? I have a question. Um, yeah, go ahead, Francis. So I noticed that there's a lot of a percentage, there's a very small percentage that's actually successful with the iReady, it seems. I'm wondering if because I, I know that my child is in fourth grade and I see the work that they give her and I feel it's too mature for her at her age. And I feel like, are, are we, I know that we want to be college ready, but maturity has a lot to do. It has to kind of balance out with maturity and the work that you're giving to them. So when you give a child like in, in second or third grade, tell them to make a, a sentence with the word contemplation that's very difficult for them to comprehend. And then what you get is a lot of people who don't get a good score, right? Because they don't really understand what that means. But if you give them another word that kind of fits their maturity, now you have people understanding. So I think, I understand we want to expose them to like big words and all that, but if they're not mature enough to understand and actually put together these, these ideas, um, how realistic are our goals then is my question, because if we're too, are, you know, we always say when you make goals, they have to be realistic. They, they can't be so far out there that you're not going to reach them. And then we have these scores. So that that's that's my my question. Yeah. yeah so, 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 so I, okay. I, I just want to speak to a couple of things. First of all, I think it's really important to know. And I know that we see the low scores, you know, especially as you go up into the upper grades from sixth, seventh and eighth. Now, um, I think a couple of important things to look at is number one, I ready also uh, tests on um, certain areas that haven't been taught yet. Um, because they are expectations within the curriculum. And then we also have to look at, and these are things that individual schools are doing, the social emotional aspect of taking a standardized test and talking to our upper grade students around how, um, you know, what type of testing conditions have they placed themselves in, right? You know, the, and these are things that individual schools should um, be talking about as you're structuring MTSS. There's a lot of different topics of education that I think are important for us to know, right? Like we have, and, and I'm experiencing this myself with my own children, you know, we have that whole opt-out section of students that do not have the, the mindset to sit for standardized tests. Right. So my daughter's friends 
are having a really hard time taking the SATs right now. They're coming out of a pandemic and they never took a test, right? So from third grade to eighth grade, they never took a standardized exam because many of their parents chose to opt them out. And then you had ninth grade and then they, they were in a pandemic. They don't know even how to sit for a regents exam. So some of it is around test taking skills that we may need to teach also. Um, Francis, what you're bringing up is really where I um, push for parent discussions and parent engagement on the SLT, because that's part of curriculum. Um, I, I would have to know the context as to what, why that vocabulary word is being used, right? Like you could teach um, words in context in a sentence, um, and, and no matter what word you put there, you're teaching the skill of, of how, to, how to unpack the, the meanings of words in context. So I don't know how that was placed in there, but I, I definitely think we, um, our iReady data is something that we should be unpacking at the school level. And Dr. D'Antona and I are spending time talking to our principals about that, right? But absolutely, we should be asking as SLT members to see what our current iReady data looks like and how the school is tackling that, right? So if, if you are in a middle school and your eighth grade data looks like that, then we need to start writing um, CEP goals that are aligned to that. And I don't think we do that enough, right? And we don't do that enough because... We don't necessarily, you know, we, we have to get on the scale. So I think all of those conversations really do need to happen at the school level where we're saying, what are we doing about this? Yes, Joe. Okay, so the question I have, if they're being tested on things that they're not taught, like what are they doing with that? After, like, how are they reacting to that? The, so the, Joe, so- What are you yeah, doing so with that information? So the 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 iReady is is a is on a, it's a diagnostic scale. So kids are going to be given questions across a range of um, range of concepts and and topics, um, and then it will adjust based on where kids are. You know, so if they are unable to respond to, let's just say, for example, a sixth grade concept. Um, or they let, or they answer it correctly, they'll continue to raise the raise the bar to see where those children are, which is why they'll get, be put in a range of either above, they'll be put in a range of early on, maybe one level below, maybe two levels below, because the, the assessment itself will adjust based on how students respond. So if they respond and they can't, they can't necessarily get to, the, they're not at that level for that concept, it will bring it down to a space where, they, where they're able to respond or show the, 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 this assessment where they, will, where they currently lie in, in context of their ability to respond to certain certain questions that they give. So what, what does happen, what Danielle's mentioning around things like geometry and measurement, those topics tend to be things that they cover towards the latter part of the school year. So if they get a question on geometry and measurement, they might not necessarily be able to answer on grade level types of work, but they will be able to likely answer things that are a grade level before that, because that's when they were exposed to the concept and so the content. What is the percentage? In other words, how many of the questions are on things that they were already taught as opposed to? So, yeah, so we don't necessarily get a bank of of questions from iReady. Um, they kind of hold tight to those to those questions, um, you know, but it's within it's within their formula. I can't tell you the exact questions that they put on for each one of the each one of the domains that they put in. But they, they, it's it's organized as such so that as kids are being administered the assessment, it adjusts to how the children are responding so that they can place them accordingly with the with the skills that are necessary for them to master certain standards. That's basically in a nutshell what the what the actual assessment does. So there's so there's two ways to think about this, right? So there's common mistakes that we make. We make mistakes in not targeting key standards to close achievement gaps, but we also make mistakes when we reteach things that kids already know, which limits yeah. acceleration, right? So so it is that combination of gathering both of those things from you know from data. Yeah. So and are you looking, looking at it school by school or student to student? I don't that's I don't 
really so important. actually schools are are asked to look at their overall data the same way we're showing you overall district data but we actually break this down to individual schools and then into individual classes and then into individual students so last week i went into a classroom with um, student data, and I was actually watching the relationship between what the teacher was doing and the content and the student's response to it by their iReady scores, right? So if you were accelerated in this area, I looked to see how the teacher was targeting that. Um, because remember, and I go back to saying, we teach students not just content, right? So the content is if a, a, a student who already knows this information and can do it well, should not be asked to do it again, right? So what other types of acceleration are we planning for? But then your students who don't know it, what does that look like in your tier one classrooms, right? And then trainings for teachers in how to plan and implement that type of teaching and learning. So I think so for, for most areas, like if you're seeing the eighth grade in terms of iReady, um, you know, depending upon now, understand we gave our iReady to L students that may or may, may, or may not, not be, right. right. Yeah, and, that, and that's what this this last slide represents. It's L's that um, that are also newcomers to, you know, to to our school system uh, that are also embedded in in this data and you know the the good thing about having a um an assessment like this at the beginning of the year is that it gives us a snapshot of where kids are uh where our schools are and then schools from where their classes are and then to individual kids so it allows for that that kind of of analysis across our classrooms and then more importantly the decisions that we make once we have the information in front of us um so you know so joe to to kind of in in short because it's an adaptive assessment um, it will place kids accordingly to that to that adapted viewpoint, which allows our schools to kind of pinpoint the needs of kids in a, in a different way. Um, I, yeah, I have a question, Michael. I think it's a, it's almost like um, adding on to Joe's because um, I, I understand that the kids are individually tested. But what I don't understand is how are they then being taught if overall they all have the same homework? They all come home with the same homework. So those kids who are advanced have the same homework to those kids who, who are not so advanced. Why do they have the same homework? If that's the case, why don't they have different homeworks for those that need so that you're helping them escalate? You, do you understand what I mean? That's yes. what so, so one, yeah, so one of the things, Francis, that we talk about is access. So the standards are the same, right? And and so what we don't want to do is start separating different assignments to get to the same standard. So you could give the same homework, but different students Wait, have, have different minute. ways to access it, uh, to access it. So you can't, you, you know, one of the things that happens is, is when you start looking at, you know, differentiation and not access, you still get students who are not asked to hit the same standard. Right. So we've been talking about how you provide access points to students, whatever that looks like, to make sure that they can all do the same homework. When you get to high school, nobody's going to say, you know, you do this kind of research paper and you do this kind of research paper. Everybody's got to do the research paper, you know, so. So oh, but if you're saying, Danielle, but if you're saying that you're testing kids individually to help them, how are they getting this help to get to that standard? Is that right? That's my question. So, so that's, that's where there's been discussions about access points and teaching students not content. So someone's homework, may, they may have the same task or the same type of, of assignment, but how the student gets it done is what's the different key to it. But once again, Francis, you're bringing up some really good questions that should be asked at the school level mm -hmm. and how do we how do we address those those shifts in culture now that we're creating these database cultures yeah and and it's kind of embedded and you'll see in the in the language of the goals the goal the, the language and the goals didn't really adjust um uh, didn't adjust too much but it, the point still connected to how are we using the information we have to be strategic not only in tier two and tier three but in that tier one um, instruction in terms of what are we doing in order to support children to give them access to the uh, to the content that is you know that's going to be put in front of them that is intended to, for children to meet standards um, you know and I and I do agree with Danielle I think that is definitely a, a conversation to have 
um, most definitely at the at the at the SLT level for sure. Uh, in regards to, so we have this information. Now, what does that mean for the children inside of our classrooms? Um, and that's something that is really important. Okay, I, any I other a, comments? I, I have a question about your charts. Um, uh, usually, um, uh, based on, you know, uh, experience that I've had uh, throughout many schools and districts, as, um, as the grade level goes up, uh, scores tend to go down um, difficult to but uh, if I'm reading this L chart correctly it's the exact opposite uh, here um, that um, I guess because the L's get acclimated um, uh, uh, oh, yeah, you know, yeah Gus, level. you know, yeah, no, you know what our, our problem is? And, and actually, I had a very interesting conversation with an L student when I visited one of the middle schools the other day. Remember, we talked about for our L's, we get a significant number of um, English language learners coming to the district in fifth grade. So these children are new to us, and whereas um, our younger English language learners that come, much of the curricula in literacy is um, phonemic awareness and phonics. So their um, individual, so, so we would say like the, the beginning language needs are a large part of the um, curriculum in the early childhood grades. So we see a lot of students who begin in kindergarten as English language learners test out by third grade because they're getting that access to the la the early language skills. When you come into middle school and you're coming as an English language learner in middle school, it's very different because we don't have the phonemic awareness as part of the content because if you test a lot of our students and, and when you look at iReady, most um, most students test out of phonemic awareness um, in our middle school, so it's not part of the content. Um, so that's where you see these large numbers of students are newcomers that come later on. That's why the chart looks different. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah uh, the, uh, our English language learners are moving target um, because as children test out, we get new children that, that come in um, in their place. So um, it, it, unless you're looking at it over time, um, this may look like, you know, we have, uh, children that are not moving, you know, for, you know, in terms of our L's and it's not necessarily the case. This is, you know, a little bit deceiving, uh, in some respects, because, um, it does engage children that are within their first three years of service. that are also, uh, you know, engaging in an, in an assessment that is going to be around standards at grade level. And, you know, it, 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 I wish I could say that, that for all our L's, we're able to move them to a space of proficiency within three years. Um, you know, research is, indicates it's five to seven for, for English language learners to become proficient in a language. So, um, so needless to say, that's why this particular chart looks like that. Danielle, I have a question for you, Danielle. Um, mm -hmm. So you're saying that I was always under the understanding that the curriculum comes from higher up and all the schools have to implement them. Are you saying that every school gets to pick and choose their curriculum? Um, yeah, I mean, they they do within um, core curriculum choices. Um, and then the way they provide access to what's within that curriculum is different. Like, so we shouldn't be, one of the things that we've been talking to schools about is you're not changing your curriculum because your curriculum has been approved as um, next generation learning standards aligned. It's what you do within those units of study. So, so what we've really been spending a lot of time talking about is if you have a classroom that has English language learners in it or a classroom where your student data looks a certain way, you cannot teach the curriculum at its face value, right? It's what you do with those lessons and how you provide access for students. Those are the conversations that like you had brought up where we're saying to talk about what homework looks like, what expectations look like, what tasks look like, right? So so it's not changing the curriculum every time something new comes up, but it's what are the key standards within a unit of study and how are we addressing them? Okay, all right, Mike, let's okay. go because we got it. No, I know. Um, okay, sorry guys. Um, 
similarly for for our we we also administered the math assessment across the district um over 22,600 students completed the i ready math assessment across across grades k through um k through eight here is the breakdown you guys will have access to this to this um document as well um for you know for your own information if you want to look more deeply at it um so the i ready math uh assesses in these four categories number number and operations algebra and algebraic thinking measurement data and geometry uh overall as a district the data indicate that our students in the upper grades had the highest percentage of children on or above grade level as well as the highest percentage of children two or more grade levels below which is pretty interesting if you look at this this document it almost kind of has that little funnel in, in in between and then on the outside you have um for upper grades a, a greater percentage of children performing on or above and then when you look over to the left hand side you have less less children in that kind of middle one grade level below range and a larger percentage of our children are two or more grade levels below um when we're looking at grade six seven and in eight um you know the similar types of percentages in the earlier grades but we do start to see some of these gaps start to show themselves um you know in grade one two three and four that range starts to to expand a little bit uh in terms of the number of children that are two or more grade levels below in mathematics um in terms of by ethnicity a similar type of pattern as to what we noticed for our reading assessment uh in this case our asian population was the had the highest percentage of children that were on uh or above grade level uh, our black and Hispanic subgroups had the highest percentage of children performing two or more grade levels below uh, when we're looking at the uh, the iReady math assessment that was just administered. Uh, for our students with disabilities, again, you're going to see a very common set of, uh, of of data across children in terms of performing on or above. When you look from grade eight all the way through kinder from kindergarten all the way through grade eight, excuse me you're going to see a very similar percentage of children that are on or above. What becomes something that we are we, we definitely need to pay attention to is the percentage of children that are two or more grade levels below. You can see what happens over the course of grade levels. And this is a similar pattern that we noticed inside of reading as well, particularly for our students with disabilities. Uh, on average, it was about nine and a half percent of our children that were currently on or above. Um, Similar to the reading data, math data demonstrates a higher percentage of students two or more grade levels be below as the grades move from grade one through eight. Um, and for our L's, again, similar type of pattern, you'll see that the percentage of children that are currently on or above um, is pretty consistent across grade levels. Um, average around 10% of our children are currently on or above. Um, a similar type of pattern as we move from grade one all the way through the grade levels a larger percentage of our children are currently uh two or more grade levels below now what we what we do anticipate and what we saw last year uh is that these bars will will change by the time we get to mid-year and then as we get to the end year we don't anticipate these to be the same by the end of the school year and we do look uh, for our schools to make a tremendous amount of progress as the year goes on, which is the real goal of having data systems that allow us to really look and identify those patterns and trends amongst our students uh, within our classrooms, within our school, so we can make really good choices and decisions around what we're going to do to ensure that they have access to the curriculum in classrooms. <clears throat> and that is at the tier one, two, and three level. Obviously, tier one is is super important in terms of what we do day to day, class to class um, in our classrooms and then tier two, tier three for children that do need that additional intervention. So this is a snapshot. It's not the only snapshot that our that our schools are referencing. They do have in class information that they're utilizing as well uh, that give them additional info to support the decisions in their classrooms. So uh, does anyone have any questions about math? Thank you, Lewis. I don't think anyone heard you, but thank you. No, that's the point. Okay. So really, really quickly, just to go through our draft goals. <clears throat> so the ELA goal uh, that we originally had is below, and we've kind of connected this one to the focusing on early childhood literacy. Um, 
we, we do really believe in the strategic use of the data systems that our schools are, are um, or have developed and will be utilizing with their teachers uh, to support um, improved literacy for our kids across our classrooms. And that includes, you know, the, the, the implementation of curriculum and assessment tools that support improved outcomes for our learners. Now, in this particular case, because this is a focus on early childhood literacy, um, the goal could be adjusted, and this is where we do need your feedback, if, to make sure that you guys do see the alignment between what we were originally asking um, and then the focus on early childhood literacy, which is part of what uh, the chancellor's academic priorities connect to. So we do see a tremendous amount of alignment to this, especially with the use of data to support MTSS um, for our youngest learners in grades K uh, through two. So this is where where we've we've kind of landed for this goal. And guys, I'm going to go through these slides, but if you have particular questions or you don't see alignment, please take note of it and we will we will definitely come back to it. Um, for our supportive environment goal, we realign this to be connected to the culturally relevant and sustaining curriculum in every school uh, goal. And as you guys know, uh, we are taking part or uh, the vast majority of our schools, which means all, all but one at this point are connected to the Civics for All initiative uh, in District 25, uh, which really focuses on, on building um, opportunities for our kids to engage in social action projects. So every single one of our schools has staff that are currently being trained along with uh, an administrator to really support this work inside of our classrooms. And we do really see a, a, a deep connection to this and building that culturally relevant and sustaining curriculum in each of our schools, as a lot of this work is coming from students, uh, student, you know, it's about student ownership and them connecting to things that are currently happening within their communities to develop a project to support improvement in those areas. So we saw a, a nice alignment between this goal that we had already, already established and the new framing around ensuring culturally relevant, sustaining curriculum in every school as a starting place for this work. Um, this is a new goal. Um, we did not have something per se that that was around digital citizenship, although we do have things that we're doing as a district that are connected to it. Uh, so we we adjusted uh, in, in this respect. So this one is brand new and we'd love to have your feedback on it as well. But at this point, every single one of our schools in District 25 um, is engaging or has engaged in professional learning with Apple. Um, and the, the purpose of our Apple partnership is around integration of technology um, through the development of authentic learning tasks with the integration of technology. So the, the focus that our schools are engaging in right now is really to, to look at their current tasks um, how and, and augmenting those tasks so that they can pr promote student voice and opportunities for critical reasoning inside of the work. So the goal that we've established is that through this partnership, all schools will implement at least one transfer task, uh, that, that uh, a unit of study that culminates in at least one transfer task during the school year based on the training that they're currently going in. Um, and because it's connected to Apple, there is obviously a connection to technology and how the technology will allow children to kind of build on their current skills with the use of various tools that Apple has to offer. Now, question around, do you need to have an Apple? No, not necessarily need to have an Apple. It's really around how we use some of those tech tools that they have access to uh, that Apple can share that are that are uh, usable across platforms. Um, school leadership goal, we've kind of, we've realigned this to investing in special education. These goals, uh, again, um, we saw a connection to in that it's a it's a focus on our special education children. Uh, with a with an emphasis on MTSS and how it's being used to support improved outcomes for our uh, special uh, children with special needs in the area of math and reading. Uh, as we go on, focus again uh, around the use of information that we have access to to support improved outcomes. Uh, ensuring our students are college and career ready. Um, this goal in particular, we we connected to. Um, to our equity visits and connections to mathematics. Um, one, of, one of the things that we do know and we um, is, is super important is mathematics 
is one of those one of those uh, areas that are super important for our children to have access to, to college and career. Um, so it is one that we do want to continue to emphasize. It builds on the fact that we've added this to our district goal uh, in terms of math, and we do see a nice connection to in, to promoting that college and career readiness for our children. So we connected our math goal to this to this component specifically for that reason, um, as it is a springboard into high school and beyond uh, for our children to have access to um, to uh, math supports that will promote uh, improved problem solving inside of uh, problem solving skills for them uh, moving forward. So this is where we connected uh, the ensuring uh, our students are college and career ready to our math goal. Um, the multilingual learners goal, uh, we did connect and align to, uh, to our parent chats. Uh, we are going to revise this a little bit as we believe that um, in terms of providing greater support, we do wanna hear from our families and we thought this was a natural connection uh, to that for all of our schools so that we're providing um, parent chat opportunities uh, for our multilingual learners uh, as well as their families uh, to gather some feedback and and um, and use that use that feedback to support next steps across our school communities. And I believe that was our last goal. We covered each of the six areas that um, the chancellor has kind of identified from focusing on early childhood literacy through our ELA goal, um, creating that culturally relevant sustaining curriculum uh, as a starting point in terms of our social action projects with the Civics for All curriculum, uh, developing digital citizens through our work in partnership with Apple and the development of authentic learning tasks, um, investing in special ed with a focus on MTSS, college and career readiness through our focus on mathematics, um, and MTSS, MTSS there as well, and really bolstering our problem solving um, strategies and um, our uh, multilingual learners through our parent chats. And that kind yep. of uh, connects to each of our goals at this point. Yep, so um, thank you, Dr. Mike. So one of these were the six points that um, Gus had mentioned. So I wanna say two things. So Gus, at our next meeting, um, what I really want to do is actually go over the entire template, but I know for the sake of time, we just have so many things happening in the city right now in terms of education. I'm sorry, I know that this meeting is very long, and I do want everyone to have a chance to present today, but um, you know, with the changes that are happening and all of the new initiatives that are coming out, we just want to make sure that you guys see how this is aligned to the work that we're doing as a district. So um, next month, we will once again go back over these goals and go over the entire deal, the, the new DCEP template. But does anybody have any questions before we move on? Okay, um, Mike, can you just go to uh, the one about the uh, curriculum, the curriculum? Yep. So I know that Francis had spoken to me and I, and I did tell her that um, I think it's important that she presents this both right. to President's Council, but also to the DLT. So, Francis, um, this was the the part of the conversation that we had that you were talking about building culturally relevant and sustaining curriculum with parent voice. So, I was wondering if you could um, uh, talk about what you were interested in doing from a parent leadership perspective. I, I think that just from hearing and just from experience, uh, personal experience, I feel that in every culture and every history in our culture, there are heroes and there are people that, you know, um, different have different people have different perspectives. For example, I'll give Malcolm X. Malcolm X to, for many was a hero and to some he was not because uh, he believed in, in violence. So what I, what I think that, uh, a, an education standpoint would be to just give the children the information and let them have their own perspective of who this person is to them. So I, I spoke with uh, Danielle and, and, and along the lines, I was thinking of something called, I'm just going to title it, bring in, bring in the heroes, right? And there's a lot of heroes that we don't um, hear about for whatever reason, it was not selected to be part of our history. So I'm challenging families to go down and I guess like I'll just 
use elementary school and it can go, trickle up to college, you bring in the heroes inside, you Google, right? You, you, you ask your family and families have their own history, but you bring in people that nobody knew about. I mean, I'm sure I can bring in some heroes from my culture that nobody knew about. And you would then know, oh, wow, this person did this. And then for elementary, how we would implement it with them is uh, they can pick and choose. They can pick a male or a female. Doesn't have to be because I'm a woman. I have to pick a woman hero. I can pick whoever I want to be. And you can pick somebody, but we tried to pick someone we didn't learn about. Not because then everyone's going to bring in the people that we've learned about already. So I'm just thinking that it's interesting to see and, and, and for other people to bring in heroes in their culture that we didn't learn in history and um, and that we yeah. could then learn about through someone else even acting out or giving us some insight. I thought that would be a good way of knowing that there's more than what we learn in history. We learn from other people. We learn from each other. And, you know, I thought that was a great idea and really aligned to what we are trying to do as a district. Remember, we talked about it's about going into the curriculum and have the curriculum meet the needs of your students. And it's twofold. Right. So we want to learn the history of um, the commute and be culturally sustaining of the cultures of the community we represent. But it's also about um, learning across cultures. So um, I thought this was a great idea for Frances to present to President's Council and the schools that she works with. Um, because one of the things that Dr. D'Antone and I are talking about is creating these banks of units of study that are culturally responsive to share with schools. So last week I had a conversation with um, the, uh, the Korean consulate and we talked about um, them providing us with resources and access that we could share with our communities about the Korean culture, right? So it's just around the sharing of resources about different communities. So our schools now have access to that. And they can make decisions about, you know, where they can in, be inclusive of these things within, and now let's go back to Apple Tasks, that open up options and opportunities for students where you're not only limited to researching certain people, right? So so that is something that I, I really do want to continue to work on. And, and thank you, Francis, for mentioning that as well. I thought it was a, a great idea. Um, okay, before we go on to high schools, are there any questions, concerns about the goals and things we just mentioned? Okay. I heard something. I heard no. someone say something. Nope. All right. So, okay. Bill, you're up. All right. I'm going to share my screen and we'll be off to the races. Does everyone see um, the high school update page? Yes, no? Yes, yep. yeah, yes, go, Bill. yes, we do. All right. All right, so I'm just going to kind of read through some of these um, uh, myself and the team uh, for Superintendent, Superintendent Lindsay have been working uh, diligently to make sure that all the CEPs are updated and revised. Uh, that deadline uh, has already passed. That was October 29th. Uh, as Abby stated uh, quite eloquently about the special education recovery services, um, the deadline has been extended from November 15th to December 6th. Uh, and services must commence for our highest priority students. Uh, there's also another deadline for the bed survey. This is a survey where uh, sco uh, schools are asked, they have to collect uh, information on their staff, they have to collect information on their students and policy data. And this all goes into one big database. Uh, this is due November 10th, um, fast approaching. Uh, the fall professional learning opportunity, again, this is uh, academic supports for our students, knowing that coming back from the pandemic, uh, we're having uh, synchronous and asynchronous sessions have been developed uh, based on the school communities, uh, in addition to the DOE created supplemental cur curriculum sources. Um, very important, uh, the mayor's uh, graduate scholarship program is open to all city employees and it offers full or partial scholarships at participating schools in the area, such as business and public administration, policy, law, engineering, nursing, etc. Um, so that's really a, a wonderful program. We want to try to get as many people to apply as, as possible. 
Uh, on Wednesday, November 10th, we're also having uh, an evening parent teacher conferences for the high schools. Um, and again, uh, that will probably be remote. Most of the, of the teachers have already expressed interest in, in that being a remote offering. Um, as the elementary schools are using their screeners, the high schools are using our own screeners, which um, we're using map growth. And um, the whole idea with map group is that if you have more insight into the students, you'll have better outcomes uh, and really drilling down into what the students um, uh, deficits are. And then how do we try to uh, lift up all of those students? Um, so the beginning of the year assessments were due 1029. Uh, so uh, schools are currently in the process of reviewing that data and um, you know, creating plans based on uh, you know the challenges that their school community is having. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we've heard a lot about the the different social emotional screeners and the challenges that schools have been uh, having. Uh, you know, putting this uh, logistically so that it works for our schools, especially some of our large high schools have had challenges with this. Uh, but the idea is to, uh, you know, once we offer this uh, social emotional survey, and again, uh, parents do have the option to opt out, so they don't have to take it if they don't want to take it. Um, but the idea is to gather this data, and as uh, they were saying earlier on today's meeting, to come up with different systems, MTSS systems, to support the students. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, Right at the superintendent's office, we're always trying to bridge the gap between um, parents and students, especially at the high school level. Uh, parents are are not always um, in attendance. Oftentimes, they they're you know they're they're not as connected as they would be if it's elementary or middle school. So we're having um, a, a virtual meeting with parents on Wednesday, November seventeenth, and it's in the evening, and this will be on a Zoom uh, platform. Uh, I'm going to move to the next slide here. Um, so this is good news in the community. What's happening with District 25 schools? Uh, so I know that last month I, I talked a little bit about uh, John Bound and their agriculture agricultural program and how they um, were were really highlighted in the CSA newspaper. So these are pictures from the CSA newspaper. You can see uh, Dr. Ionelli on the left here uh, with with some of those trees that they're, that they're going to be uh, planting. Um, and I also want to highlight John Bound this month uh, because they have another really interesting uh, partner program. This is a partner program with Delaware Valley University, uh, which is in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And the agreement between the school and the college is that it'll allow high school students to earn uh, college credit there. So the program is going to save uh, high school students time and tuition costs if they enroll at that particular school. Um, I also want to highlight Veritas uh, High School, which uh, has been very proactive with their ESSA data uh, and building in interventions for uh, students that need it. And uh, additionally, um, they have ha already at uh, 1031, they had 372 out of their 611 students had already completed the SEL screener. Uh, and this was achieved uh, due to their second year of having every student assigned to a teacher in the building for a bi-monthly wellness check. So this is a school that's really, they've always uh, adopted the idea, right, to, to check on students' uh, uh, well-being. Um, and this was something that started last year, they're saying, uh, during the pandemic, uh, even before the survey came out. So, so those are uh, two of the schools that we wanted to highlight. Um, and, and as I said before, uh, most of this is is logistics and, and dates, but there are things that uh, need to get completed. Um, for Flushing High School, uh, which is uh, for this district, the only TSI school and their TSI subgroup is the Hispanic students. Uh, they will have their TSI uh, CEP support visit tomorrow um, and that will be a remote visit. Um, and that concludes the high school report. Are there any questions or comments? I know I ran through that quick. I think you're on mute, Danielle. Um, thank you. All right. Um, new business. Does anyone, do any of the constituent groups have new business? Um, Queens High School? President's Council, any new business?
No, Shirley, we good? Okay. Um, Joe, CEC, any new business? No, other than our CEC meetings tomorrow evening, we have uh, Abby coming to our uh, to talk about special education. That's our focus tomorrow. Okay. Um, anyone else? Mary? I know uh, Lamar had to jump off, but Mary? No, we're good. Okay. So um, with that, I want to thank everyone. Like I said, I know this was a I'm very sorry. long meeting, but... Oh, I'm go ahead, so Shirley. I'm sorry. I just... Yeah, um, I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I just want to let everybody know this affects everybody. The pandemic EBT, the second distribution had started last month, about October 15th. So um, by the by the end of this month, everybody, all the New York City schools um, family should have received, you know, should receive the second distribution. Um, I think, um, and then the updates to the A660, as I said earlier, is in public comment and, and should be voted on on the PEP. Um, I'm actually, you know, we're working on a briefing to the PEP members for tomorrow on the, the proposed changes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So if we are, um, you know, if, if there's nothing else, I would like for consensus to um, uh, end the meeting. Anybody against ending the meeting? It was a really long one, <laughs> over three hours. <laughs> almost three hours. All right. So we will see uh, everyone tomorrow. If you're interested in the CEC meeting, looking forward to it. And uh, if not, have a great day, everyone. All the best to everyone. All Thank right. You. Take care. Have a good one all. Take care. Have guys. a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.